The story of the rise and fall of Death Row Records reads like a thrilling detective novel, with its characters like heroes from the pages of a book who live dangerously and vividly. It's an instructive story that tells of the conquests and cruelties that arise when money and power begin to suffocate music. At a time when commercial pop rap like MC Hammer dominated the markets and charts, Death Row set a radically different rap trend, turning it into an international phenomenon. As a bastion of West Coast gangster rap, Death Row didn't just sell records under the Thug Life brand, it sold a lifestyle. And gangsterism, crime, illegal drugs, and constant weapon-related disputes became an integral part of Death Row Records. So let's talk about this bloody organization. The music that came out of Compton in the late 80s forever changed the course of hip-hop, both artistically and politically. No one played a more decisive role in this transformation than NWA, the pioneering rap group that America both loved and hated. At the helm was Dr. Dre, the producer who crafted the group's debut direction, an aggressive and raw album called Straight Outta Compton that pushed aside radio to connect with the streets. The cries of skeptics about immorality were drowned out by lines that vividly described violence, drugs, and police brutality in the South Central backdrop, all amidst hundreds of thousands of record sales. This is the earliest part of the story of this book. NWA was making money, but the artists behind the music weren't getting their due. After financial disputes and other disagreements, Dr. Dre and his partner Doc decided to break out of this vicious cycle. And here they encounter the future rap music mogul Marion Sugar Knight, an imposing 160 kilogram man who would later be called the scariest man in the hip hop industry. Before becoming a major player in the music business and before getting a managerial position, Suge worked as a bodyguard for Bobby Brown. Swearing to make a new label the best in the country, Suge co founded Death Row Records with Dre and Doc after things didn't work out with Ruthless Records, owned by Eazy E. There was already criminal activity at that time, as Eazy later claimed in a lawsuit that Suge and his squad threatened him with lead pipes and baseball bats. Suge Knight, who was tasked with handling business matters, used his ability to extract artist royalties from record labels in various ways. First of all, I like to thank God. Second of all, I like to thank my whole entire Death Row family on both sides, you know what I'm saying? With the assistance of Solar Records, which offered Death Row an office and studio in Hollywood, the new organization had a place to call home, but the label was in serious need of investments. Money came from Michael Harris, one of Los Angeles' biggest drug lords, who legitimized his business through various means, including producing the Broadway play Checkmates, which, by the way, gave actor Denzel Washington his big break. At that time, Harris was imprisoned on charges of drug possession and attempted murder. Therefore, his lawyer, David Kenner, the best lawyer with Hollywood connections, became the intermediary in the deal with Suge Knight. Under Kenner's guidance, who was observing the negotiations, Harris invested $1.5 million in death row for 50% of the shares. The public announcement of the partnership took place at the label's opening party. All of this seemed to portend the impending criminal chaos in the music industry in the coming years, so death row finally got a stake in the game, and it did so not without the help of money obtained through the use of weapons and trade in prohibited substances. In general, a good start. The Interscope company based in Los Angeles was on the brink of bankruptcy at the time, but they took a decisive gamble and teamed up with death row to release Dr. Dre's highly anticipated solo debut, which ultimately became a hit. The Chronic did not disappoint, becoming a multi-platinum milestone that would define the G-Funk sound for years to come. It's like this and like that and like this and uh, it's like that and like this and like that. Snoop Dogg's debut album, Doggy Style, and the four Death Row albums that followed it also achieved platinum status. The label's militant politics, deep lyricism, reflection of social issues, and the era's drug culture that turned Los Angeles into a combat zone made Death Row a distinct cultural value. The label also took under its wing Nate Dogg, Thar Dog Pound, RBX, The Outlaws, Corrupt, and Lady of Rage, who made uncompromising and attractive music. It's the mouth of the wild, creeping and crawling, Yiggy, yes, yo, and Snoop Doggy Dogg. But naturally, the pearl of the label was Tupac, who was released on bail from a New York prison thanks to Suge Knight, where he was serving time for assault charges. He immediately signed a contract for several albums with Death Row Row practically on a piece of toilet paper and released All Eyes On Me, the first double album in rap and one of the fastest selling rap albums in history. Songs like California Love and Two of America's Most Wanted were evidence of the undeniable creative synergy between Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg and Tupac, who produced one of the most memorable and innovative records of the 90s under the watchful eye of Suge Knight. With these hitmakers, Death Row became the owner of the largest collection of hip-hop superstars simultaneously on one label. The four horsemen of Death Row, Tupac, Dre, Snoop Dogg, and Suge Knight, appeared on the cover of Vibe magazine in February 1996, which told the story of Death Row's downfall. Police reports were sent to the label's address. Snoop was on trial for murder. Ken Nahum, Death Row's staff photographer, remembered that Tupac and Suge Knight came to the shoots with ankle bracelets. They all had legal problems. It was a wild time. They really lived the thug life lifestyle. During the dawn of this awe-inspiring label that released tracks under the slogan, Only Hits and Nothing More, it seemed untouchable. And it seemed almost incomprehensible that a label making over 
over $100 million a year would fall to its knees in such a striking way. But even then, many understood that with constant legal problems, the label would not last long. Early signs of upcoming trouble appeared at the 1995 Source Awards, where Death Row received a very cold reception from the New York crowd. All it took to unleash a full-scale war was a single comment by Shug Knight, referring to Puff Daddy, the head of rival label Bad Boy. His quote was, Any artist that want to be an artist, stay a star, and don't have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the videos, all on the records, dancing, come to death row. These infamous and regrettable words became the main catalyst for the beginning of a major war between the East and West Coasts. After Tupac was shot and robbed in the lobby of a hotel in 1994, relations between the two factions suddenly turned into a real storm. Hit em Up confirmed this hostility in an unparalleled manner by Tupac, who insulted both label Bad Boy and Notorious Big. Biggie, remember when I used to let you sleep on the couch and beg a bitch to let you sleep in the house? <laughs> The label began to crack both internally and externally. Its studio was filled with friends and acquaintances of Sugar Knight, who were members of gangs and LAPD officers undercover. Shug himself became even more ruthless in his behavior within the company. Snoop Dogg described the situation in the studio as, everybody was under his chokehold. As Death Row's wealth grew, so did its bloody aura. All of this unhealthy atmosphere did not contribute to the creation and release of new albums. And in March 1996, Dr. Dre left Death Row to create his own label, Aftermath. <laughs> On September 7th, 1996, six months after Dre's departure, Tupac was killed on the road in Las Vegas while sitting in the passenger seat of a car driven by Suge Knight. He was transferred to a hospital in an artificial coma, but on September 13th, he died. Just three hours before the shootout, Suge got into a fight with Orlando Anderson, who later became the prime suspect in the case of Tupac's murder. The fight was captured on surveillance camera at the hotel where Knight was, and the footage was used to charge Suge with violating his probation, for which he received nine years in prison, serving half the sentence. The reign of terror officially ended, and and the slogan kill or be killed embodied at death row proved too contradictory and unstable. Suga is now serving 28 years for running over and killing a man. And what about the others? I was here for disposition on one matter, sentencing on another matter. We'll start with the TA case. Matters here for sentencing. I've read and considered the transcript of plea. The report of the probation officer. Tupac's memory lives on thanks to his immortal discography, which includes countless posthumous releases, solidifying his status as a hip-hop martyr. Snoop Dogg remains relevant thanks to his willingness to experiment and be active not only in music. Dr. Dre is a billionaire businessman, one of the most successful artists of all time, who also remains true to music and increasingly creates for the soul. And perhaps if it weren't for him, we would never have heard Eminem and 50 Cent and never received the Beats by Dre headphones. During its years of existence, Death Row sold over 50 million album copies and earned around 750 $50 million in profits. Looking back on this history, one can conclude that the shelf life of a company that abuses violence, rudeness, and manipulation will never be long-lasting. And it's one thing if it simply falls apart and goes under, but as practice shows, such a policy can also lead to the death of people. And still I see no changes. Can a brother get a little peace? It's warm on the streets and a war in the Middle East. Such is the story of the bloody death row label. What do you think? Could such a label emerge today? Write your opinion in the comments, like, and subscribe to the channel. Goodbye.